Dan, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about the Shared Resources Program, Department of Homeland Security's Shared Resources Program. Uh, I, uh, you wanted me to give, give a little history. I've been a ham since 1955. Uh, I'm the immediate past president of the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation, which is a uh, 501c3 that provides funding and direction for the Windlink radio, amateur radio uh, and other uh, email system. Uh, I'm the uh, currently the Windlink administrator and a member of the Windlink development team and the board of directors of the Amateur Radio Safety Foundation. Uh, I'm uh, FEMA Reckwick, that's the Regional Emergency Communications Coordinating Working Group, Region 4 Oxcom Working Group Chairman. Uh, I'm a member of the Tennessee Emergency Management Commu Reserve, the Williamson County, Tennessee Emergency Management Agency Reserve and work with SHARES as a volunteer on the data working group and as their WinLink administrator, which uh, our Amateur Radio Safety Foundation provides. Uh, and last but not least, I am a, one of many assistant directors for the Delta Division to make myself available to my director for bad advice and dissent. Uh, with me, I see uh, he's there, I can see him is Ross Merlin, and Ross Merlin uh, is the program manager for SHARES. Ross started out in, uh, I, I don't know doing what, but uh, I, I caught up with him. Uh, he was the uh, uh, FNARS, the, the FEMA National Radio System uh, employed there. From FEMA, he was the frequency manager for uh, FEMA, and then their spectrum manager. He moved for the Department of Homeland Security's Wireless Management Office, where he uh, was spectrum manager for all of the Department of Homeland Security, and then moved to the Office of Communications, which is now called ECD, uh, the Emergency Communications Division, uh, he, where he authored the NIFOG, the National Interoperability Field on Operations Guide. From there, he moved to the Shared Resources Program as program manager, and uh, has been an excellent uh, mentor for me in this program, and I'm sure many others. Uh, so I wanted to make one statement uh, here. Um, I am a volunteer. I don't speak for shares. I speak about shares. So uh, I've got Ross here uh, to kick me in the shins if I do something I shouldn't do or say something I shouldn't say. Uh, the presentation is wordy, and it's wordy so that it can stand on its own. Uh, so uh, if you don't want to listen to me, just read the presentation. If you don't want to read the presentation, you can listen to me. Let me see if I can get this thing up and running here. Would you tell me whether yeah, or not? Down, no, you're not on yet. Uh, down at the bottom, you'll see a green button that says share screen. That's what you, what you want to click. I thought I had done that. Well, now I can't see it. Hold on. Is it there? No, not yet. Well, there you go. That's working now. Okay. All right. Uh, so here we are. I uh, would like to talk this evening about an option for amateur radio volunteers uh, who have uh, uh, MCOM experience who have some NIMS training and you have a familiarity or a working relationship with uh, agencies that 
uh, they may serve as in their interest. Uh, you know, relying on normal public safety communication systems requires a local infrastructure, and that can lead to issues uh, in certain situations, especially for complex messages when that infrastructure disappears or is otherwise occupied. In today's world, we cannot determine uh, what our <laughs> emergencies are going to consist of. We have no idea how we're gonna predict the size of the nature of our emergency. Depending upon where we live, we have certain elements uh, that we watch and probabilities, but in today's world, uh, that is, as we found out uh, in the last few months, is not always applicable. So how do you coordinate any large disaster where you have a uh, network that has been disturbed? How do you communicate when your power, your internet, landline, cell phone, satellite phones, land mobile radio networks are all dependent on very vulnerable infrastructure and the power of the water, the fuel, the people, the weather, uh, instances uh, occur that uh, damage this infrastructure. So I wanna present an option here, uh, and that is the uh, Department of Homeland Security Shared Resources Opportunity, especially uh, uh, slanted toward the volunteer who we're talking to tonight. Uh, for civil authorities and national uh, or critical infrastructure partners, the cost is negligible when using shares. It's pr a proven option and it attracts additional resources, which are us volunteers. For the amateur radio volunteers, what are the opportunities that can the government can provide us? How do we approach the opportunity? And what are the benefits? And how do we get started if we become interested in this? Shares at one time was a Cold War Fed only program, and it has moved to an all hazard uh, emergency communication system for civil authorities of all levels and their critical infrastructure partners. Shares now under the new site is now under what, and this is I think a month or two old, the Cyber Security and Infrastructure Security Agency, CISA. And they are the nation's risk advisor, working with partners to defend against today's threats and collaborating to build a more secure and resilient infrastructure for the future. There's a lot to this parent organization, shares is but a component. So here's the general hierarchy, uh, the Department of Homeland Security, Cybersecurity and Infrastructure uh, Security Agency, uh, the National Communication Coordination, which uh, a couple of months ago was the National Coordinating Center for Communication, and then the Shared Resources Program. The, I think, and nobody's told me this, but I think all of these uh, name changes has something to do with this parent organization uh, has moved uh, from a, being a headquarters component of the Department of Homeland Security to an operational component which gives it much more autonomy. Uh, the SHARE's mission is to support the mission of its member agencies. The purpose of SHARE's is to support interoperable communications, emergency communications by radio for the national security and emergency preparedness. Uh, what is SHARE's? SHARE's is approximately 3,000 participants in this program uses multiple agency stations, it shares its resources. Thus the name, obviously. It uses DHS channels and other agencies channels, again sharing. Shares has approximately 145 HF, specific HF channels, but it also utilizes uh, other federal agency channels to the extent of 218 additional channels. Uh, for those interested in WinLink, shares WinLink uh, uses 84 specific channels on HF uh, from 2.8 to 20 megahertz. The 
these pr proven components uh, of single sideband voice, some with some using LA, uh, ALE, uh, the Winlink radio email system are all ex on exclusive channels, a very big advantage. Shares is a true emergency system that promotes volunteer participations. Remember, the amateur radio spectrum is not a true ongoing emergency service. The amateur radio service is a public service with severe Part 97 restrictions that may only be breached in extreme circumstances. I have never is since 1955 been privy to hearing of those extreme circumstances occur, but perhaps they have and I just haven't noticed it, but it's a rare occasion if ever. There's no SCC part 97 ex, uh, type acceptance hardware restrictions uh, imposed on shares like there is with the FCC. Shares uses NTIA frequencies and deals with the NTIA, not the FCC. So it permits ham equipment, much like Mars, which is much less expensive, more flexible, and believe me, is a lot easier to operate because as volunteers, we're familiar with that equipment. For the agency, it's a blessing because sometimes we can bring our own. Shares requires no external communications infrastructure on HF communications, especially in the disaster zone where it's operative. And most importantly, Shares is interoperable among civil authorities and their uh, non-government organization partners. Using the income trained ham volunteer, what can Shares provide in addition to what's provided on the ham bands? Well. Uh, when you're dealing with inoculation inventory, when you're dealing with body counts, when you're dealing with uh, personal information and uh, uh, prescription inventory and what have you, it's a wise and uh, almost in some, some states uh, mandatory to uh, protect that data. And that is a very easy thing to do in shares. In the amateur spectrum, we cannot obstruct the meaning of the content of the data so that it's not readable by all. Faster data, there's no symbol rate limit, uh, like uh, the 300 baud limit that prev prevents us from uh, moving further into technology with data communication. Um, agency personnel can operate the radio. You do not have to be an amateur radio operator. So uh, if you're at a hospital, you can, uh, uh, as an employee, operate that radio until the amateur volunteers arrive and uh, not uh, feel uh, like you're doing something you shouldn't. There's, the, there's no pecuniary interest rule with shares. In other words, if I'm an employee of that hospital and I'm being paid, I'm not allowed to operate that amateur equipment uh, on the handbands. Um, if I'm a government employee, I have a certain number of hours, I've got to keep a record supposedly, et cetera. None of that exists in shares. The exclusive use of HF channels all over the uh, HS spectrum is extremely important. Um, there, we're, with uh, hand bands, we're limited to uh, harmonically related uh, channels for the most part. Uh, there are large gaps, which I'll get to later. And, uh, so there's a much expanded HS spectrum that's channelized, uh, that's guarded and watched. Uh, and so there aren't as many propagation issues, especially the way propagation is with us in our sunspot cycle in today's world. Again, direct opportunity with other communications resources is really paramount. So uh, for a complete interoperability, stations participating in shares, may communicate with the stations such as federal departments and agencies, including their volunteer auxiliary programs. Mars is one, uh, SHARES is another, there are many. Uh, the civil authority at all levels of government. So uh, county, city, large city, county governments, uh, hospitals, uh, critical infrastructure, key resources, uh, state agencies, uh, the, the critical infrastructure and key resource providers 
include telecommunications companies, power, common carriers, hospitals, medevac coordinators, transportation, and more. CHAIRS also uh, has members in the national and regional disaster relief organizations, like the Southern Baptist Disaster Relief. Uh, Department of Homeland Security Auxiliary, uh, the NCC Auxiliary, includes volunteers who directly assist SHARES. They also have an opportunity to communicate via SHARES. So it's a mixed bag for uh, agencies uh, to provide contingency emergency communication and communicate with each other over HF radio. Uh, and also, uh, we have the Alaska Emergency Channel, uh, allowed to uh, communicate with RACES, the amateur radio stations that gave in, engaged in the five amateur uh, secondary five megahertz channels, internet gateway between SHARES, hybrid wind link network, and the HAM network. If there is a question about that, please rem remember that. Uh, and the non-US stations for disaster response coordination which could be Haiti or, or any, any uh, uh, emergency situation, uh, shares could be there. Okay, so the, the, the role of the member agency, uh, the served agencies that, that uh, and the infrastructure that registers with shares, um, it's very easy to do. Uh, they fill out a one piece piece of paper, uh, they send it in, uh, they have it signed by a, a point of entity, which is the responsible for the organization, and a point of contact, which is responsible for the station. And, and if they don't have call signs, shares can provide call signs for these agencies. Uh, hand call signs are not used on the shares channels as station identification, uh, just as a for your info. It's very important for the agencies in the shares program to participate, to keep equipment ready and operators trained. It doesn't do any good to be a member of SHARES and have the uh, equipment in a closet that nobody knows how to use and hasn't been updated in months. Uh, that does nobody any good. So it's very uh, good practice to uh, make certain that uh, if the agency personnel don't have the time to make certain that their volunteer resources keep the equipment ready and the operators trained. Uh, it's also important for example a state uh, to expand its uh, operabil interoperability by perhaps inviting others in, other agencies within the state, uh, counties, uh, other authorities, hospitals, major corporations that uh, are critical infrastructure like Federal Express, uh, Bridgestone, etc. Uh, and coordinate and manage their qualified volunteers. As far as the equipment goes, I hear all the time uh, volunteers tell me, well, the agency just says they don't have enough money to buy this or buy that, but the price is right here, okay? Compared to what else they'd have to spend, a cost of a complete amateur station with a Pactor 4 modem, et cetera, uh, is less than one P25 Motorola handheld if they're using modified amateur equipment. The NTIA, as I said before, allows this, and of course, volunteers really know how to use their own equipment. Many hams do use their own equipment. Volunteers, are, the role of the volunteer, I wanna really get into this if I may. Volunteers are managed by their member agencies. Uh, you just don't, uh, as a ham, write and say, I wanna be a shares member. Uh, you are a member through your agency any nearby agency, which could be uh, civil authorities, could be critical infrastructure, uh, hospitals, uh, it could be uh, Southern Baptist Disaster Relief and those type of organizations. Um, preferably, it's the county EMA, the state EMA, uh, organizations that are going to be called during an emergency and not just use the system, but also assist others. So volunteers may be used to operate the share stations. And of course that frees the agency staff to do work that it can't, that it can't be done by volunteers. And that is prevalent uh, where I uh, volunteer in the 
uh, Tennessee Emergency Management Agency environment, as well as the Williamson County, uh, Tennessee uh, EMA. Uh, we do the work uh, that uh, uh, can be done by volunteers, alleviating others to not work as hard, uh, to concentrate more on what they do. Uh, a roll uh, or a ham radio license is not a requirement to operate shares. The member agency is responsible for determining the qualifications of those people who do use shares in their behalf. Uh, there's no operator licenses, by the way, there's only station location licenses. So, uh, you know, um, I'm K4CJX wherever I am, but uh, with shares, I am uh, NCS 396 right here in this, this station. Agencies require NIMS training, online and classroom training if they're good agencies. Many ham radio operators have NIMS training and HF experience, and they are a valuable tool for MCOM. We just have to convince the agency of that. The value of the volunteer amateur radio operator can't be overemphasized. Uh, during the 2017 hurricane season, which also consisted of Maria in, in Puerto Rico, et cetera, uh, the FCC uh, put out comments as it related to some experiences that some of the agencies had with amateur radio and the uh, Department of Homeland Security and Public Safety Division of the FCC uh, uh, put out comments and the question they asked was, they asked two questions. The first was, to what extent were response efforts facilitated by amateur radio operators? And the Department of Homeland Security, the director of the National Coordinating Center for Communications, John O'Connor, wrote the following. In addition to the direct service provided by amateur radio operators, the indirect service of technology development, operator training, and support of the Shares Winlink Network, among others, make amateur radio an indispensable component of our national capability to prepare for, protect against, respond to, recover from, and mitigate against all hazards. Now, what else could we want than to have the Department of Homeland Security make a statement like that? I mean, that is in our behalf. And then some. The second question was by, asked by the SEC, going forward, should efforts be made to increase the use of amateur radio service in connection with planning, testing, and the provision of emergency response and recovery communication? Now, uh, the answer that the Department of Homeland Security gave was the following. We asked the commission to review those aspects of part 97 of their rules relating to emergency communications, including operational and technical restrictions, which limit the utilization of new technology. I mean, that is, is, for me, that came from heaven. That was just uh, beautiful. And uh, hopefully we all respond by doing our part. Uh, I, can, I can say that uh, two things. One, a lot of people have uh, asked me, well, are you a part of FEMA or is FEMA a part of uh, what, what you're doing? Uh, they're both uh, aspects of the Department of Homeland Security. F shares works for FEMA in the fact that FEMA uses shares. And the example would be when, uh, one prime example, when 10 individuals, all amateur radio volunteers, uh, were deployed uh, through shares to, to uh, the FEMA joint field offices, three joint field offices, I believe, in Puerto Rico. Uh, that would be a prime example of how SHARES uh, serves its agencies. So uh, looking at this entire picture here, I think we're quite fortunate to have this opportunity. It can, it can enhance what we do. We're the same people. Uh, we've been invited to the party and we should get dressed up and go. That's my opinion. Uh, now, we've got a, uh, I have a friend named Hank Keebler, and Hank Keebler was the individual many years ago that uh, was chief of operations for the Tennessee Emergency Management Agency, Anaham, and he, uh, uh, by the way, he's currently uh, an Oxcom instructor, 
uh, as a contractor, I believe. Um, and many of you may know him from that. But uh, Hank Keebler uh, introduced me to, uh, to uh, uh, the National Incident Management System the minute it got hot off the press. And I think he had an uh, in because the, uh, uh, one of the authors of that system uh, was a former director of Tennessee Emergency Management Agency. So uh, he may have had early information, I don't know, but I'd never heard of it. I went to a ham fest and there he was giving a, a, a talk. And uh, one of the things that he pro has professed since and that I hear constantly as I walk around this country talking to people um, about shares, agencies about shares, um, and that is uh, the golden rule for, for not only volunteers, but the golden rule for anybody that participates in emergency services under the National Incident Management System. And I'll just read it. First of all, I state my premise for voluntary use in the state EOC is simply that anyone, regardless of affiliation, professional or volunteer, who works for the state EOC during an emergency works for us. Their parent organization has no operational control once they set foot in the op center, and that also applies to an incident command location. The parent organization has a responsibility to train and provide communication personnel to the agency, but that's where their job ends. They are a functional unit and do not command operationally in any manner. And of course, this avoids any ambiguity in the chain of command. Very briefly, if I'm in the uh, EOC, state EOC and I'm the State Department of Transportation, somebody walks up to me and says, we've got a bridge out and you need to rebuild it immediately. There's a lot of traffic that needs to go over that bridge. And I look at my uh, uh, organization and I call back and they tell me, we just do not have the assets. I can walk over to the emergency services coordinator um, for uh, the Corps of Engineers and strike a deal with the Corps of Engineers as he goes back to his organization to find out he can assist me. And a lot is accomplished. Meanwhile, we're all reporting to that pit boss or that incident commander. The other thing that I hear all the time, and that is, please leave your ham badges and volunteer organizational hierarchy and ham jargon at the door, put it in a bucket and enter with your current skill sets and a willingness to learn and listen. Uh, this is a statement that uh, Mike Harris, the current uh, ESF2 communications manager for uh, Tennessee Emergency Ma Management Agency uh, stated. So I asked him if I could quote him uh, but I could quote this from a lot of people in a lot of different agencies. Uh, very important, critical. So what services can SHARES provide? Uh, it's scheduled, it SHARES has scheduled single sideband training nets, and some of them are voice uh, with digital. SHARES has a marvelous ALE system, and it's getting better uh, all the time. Uh, it's very professional. Uh, the Department of Homeland Security's Winlink Hybrid Radio Email Network uh, is there and it's used quite a bit. Uh, there's high frequency alerting, low frequency alerting, and there's collaboration among the various groups that you see above and other working groups. There's an interoperability working group that any SHARES member should attend once a month, uh, meets by webinar, um, in my opinion, before Kona uh, virus uh, hit us, uh, they all met at the uh, headquarters, I think, of the uh, American Red Cross. It was a great opportunity to get out of work uh, if you're a, an employee in that area for a, for a, a morning, uh, discuss uh, semi-work related uh, uh, topics, and then go eat lunch. Uh, for the person on the teleconference, it was a great opportunity to learn uh, radio and emergency communication related topics. And then there are many program working groups uh, that also uh, have periodic meetings. These are all now agencies and their volunteers. This is the net schedule, the weekly, 
and other uh, uh, radio test uh, net schedules. Uh, you can see the C, there's a CW geezer net, there's a few state nets, there's an ALE net, and then there are regional nets with specific times, specific frequencies. This is a SHARES ALE site. Uh, the, the, these are not on the air all the time. These are available ALE stations. Uh, and they are, uh, uh, I think that there's going to be more and more of them on the air as we move forward because uh, uh, it's turning out in this, in this, the way propagation is now, it's uh, becoming a very valuable asset to the agencies in the SHARES program. Uh, the SHARES WinLink program. Uh, SHARES WinLink is a true hybrid WinLink pro uh, network. Uh, the regular WinLink that you're familiar with hosts over 90 radio message server gateways, and it's growing rapidly. Uh, a radio message server is what an end user would connect to in order to get uh, traffic uh, out of the area into wherever he's trying to send it. There is another aspect of uh, radio message server. Radio message servers in the normal WinLink system all point to a single hub and they all are redundant. You can uh, take a message off of one and pick it up on another, it doesn't matter. They all home into the same hub on the uh, Amazon AWS, the Amazon cloud. Uh, they're virtual and so uh, they, they require the internet. But uh, remember, we're dealing here with Department of Homeland Security, cybersecurity. And so we have another component that is very coordinated uh, and very uh, uh, strictly held together. And that is the radio only uh, system, which turns the RMS on the normal windlink system, which is a conversion process and a tunnel into the CMS system into a network node with a MySQL database that holds messages. There are 87 such network nodes and uh, they are, this network then will run from station to station without any internet whatsoever. And of course that is available on the hand bands, but there's no coordination across the nation. There's no coordination uh, from, uh, there's no, uh, other than the regulations and the capabilities of the system, there's no uh, coordination management. So each RMS on the share system scans five channels, uh, each, each 16 to so, or so seconds. Uh, it covers the uh, entire CONUS or it covers whatever specific area uh, that that particular RMS was designed for. Uh, the state of North Carolina has three of its own and six additional. Uh, the state of Washington has the same number, um, and they, the, the ones that are, uh, the RMSs that are dealing with uh, in intrastate traffic have lower frequencies than some of the RMSs that are meant to uh, be used elsewhere. These uh, RMS stations are up 24 times 7 with fault notification for downtime that drive the sysops nuts until they do something about it. Uh, mostly volunteer resources provide not only maintenance uh, for the agencies, but they install and implement and operate these windlink systems for agencies. Not all, but most volunteer resources provide that service. Uh, the windlink system is available to any SHARES member and their designated volunteers at any time. This is what the SHARES WinLink system looks like. These are the radio message servers that uh, one would uh, seek if they're uh, in an incident or trying to put a message into uh, or bridge the internet over HF radio. Uh, and in addition, if uh, they uh, don't have the internet, these are the nodes that would forward to each other until it, these, uh, the message got to the specific designated uh, destination that the end user had previously designated as his message pickup station. Um, the solar flux index is uh, 
down at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, I hate to tell you how many solar flux indexes I've been through, and this is not the worst by any means, but it's, uh, it's long, it's been here a while. Uh, you can see where we are, we're at the bottom of the barrel. Uh, so you, one would think, well, what good is uh, HF radio or radio only if uh, we uh, are in this kind of predicament? Shouldn't we wait until things are better? Well, question is how much is better? Uh, just uh, for the heck of it, on June 3rd uh, this year at 9.30 at night my time on 15 megahertz, uh, I uh, took my 100 watt uh, station with my Pactor 4 modem and my computer and my 130 foot NFAT antenna, which is 30 feet off the ground, uh, no contest station, uh, the type of station that you would find in an incident with a wire thrown up off the, over the ground with a counterpoise. And I connected directly to NNB9HI in Oahu, Hawaii, some 600, 6,987 kilometers. I don't know, that's 4,000 some miles. It boomed in here. I could not hear any other station uh, until I got down to about nine megahertz. Uh, and I tuned across the spectrum just to see after this was over with. But this station was blasting in here. The propagation prediction that's in the client program said it would be. Uh, I was very skeptical, uh, getting ready to call its author and say, you're nuts, but it worked. And uh, uh, I sent a couple of messages. Uh, I wanna thank uh, uh, Gus, uh, Feely and Tom Overman, who uh, were on the Hawaii end of this station, because this is what I why I was able to do it. Uh, this is a quad Rosetta antenna, which covers nine acres. Each leg from center is 300 feet long. It's in a cross shape, so you've got two 600 foot legs um, crossing each other. It's 140 foot high. It consists of four vertical log periodic arrays with a so-so gain of 13 dB, but the point is the capture area is immense and the noise floor is almost no noise, minus 130 dBm. So that's something that as an amateur, I don't know of any amateurs could, could, could receive my signal at that time of night. And this thing, of course, is op open 24 times seven. It consists of two, RMSs, and supposedly going to have other duties with shares in the future. Uh, just for the heck of it, I thought I'd uh, let you see more of this because uh, we're hams. Uh, there's the configuration of the antenna in the upper right and in the, in the upper left, and the lower left is the solar driven station, and this is what it looks like inside. You can see the two packed door modems for the two stations and the battery a bank and some other stuff. So I'm in Tennessee, so I just thought I'd use TEMA uh, as an example of shares uh, activation. Uh, actually, uh, TEMA uh, is, uh, uses shares quite a bit uh, when it has to. Um, it's not as uh, voluminous as other states, but it's a lot more than others. And it has led the way uh, for Winlink uh, with emergency communications for years. Uh, the picture there at the top of the big bus, that's the command vehicle. Um, that vehicle was used uh, during the tornado mess uh, in 2000, I don't remember, uh, when we had a rash of tornadoes come through Tennessee and the then president came down here to evoke the Stafford Act and check things out. The Secret Service would not let them use their public safety radio or satellite, so they used Winlink to communicate back to the uh, EOC. That's where I found out what Hank Keebler uh, made that statement, what he really does and how he does it. Excellent. Uh, the bottom there is Williamson County. Uh, they have a converted ambulance, which is now uh, a different vehicle, but uh, they have a tower trailer that uh, has a, a complete Winlink station, RMS, VHF, UHF, 
HF amateur shares uh, everything in that trailer and in that ambulance and in that vehicle uh, that belongs to the uh, director of public safety over on the left side. This is typical of an agency operation. This is a, the Tennessee Department of Health shares network. So it's not just the EMA that's involved with shares. This is the Tennessee National Guard. They have the uh, most beautiful drop kits, twin link drop kits I've ever seen. Uh, they're military type. They, uh, you could run over them with a tank. It takes a, a good size individual to pick them up, but uh, they are built perfectly for the operation that they uh, use. Uh, and then I just thought I'd put this in here. Uh, we had uh, an ice storm some years ago, uh, quite a few if I'm not mistaken. It was uh, during my first COMEL class. Uh, we have to take COMEL every three years and this was the first one. Um, so uh, during that uh, uh, class, it began to snow in Kentucky. And uh, the uh, ESF2 lead, the communications uh, manager for the state of Kentucky, for the Commonwealth of Kentucky was there. Uh, he left about noon, had to leave the class and got home uh, very late. I uh, think I took him six or nine, eight, six, seven hours to get home. When he got there, he found out that the entire Western state was frozen over. No communication, no microwave, no satellite, no trunking, no anything. And they were concerned about their counties and their citizens in the Western part of the state. So they asked FEMA, uh, which is immediately south, uh, to uh, uh, do a recon up into a, uh, that area and report back. And of course they had uh, a single sideband uh, and they had uh, uh, mobile wind link. And this is one of the many pictures that was sent back to the state EOC and to uh, the state the Commonwealth of Kentucky by wind link. Practical application. So I uh, thank you for your time uh, and I'll stop now and see if there are any questions. Uh, I hope uh, this has uh, inspired some of us. Um, it's the same people doing the same job with a little bit more horsepower. Uh, thank God we have an amateur radio spectrum to train our people to learn how to use these implements and to understand HF radio so that we can become valuable assets to these agencies. That's it. All right, well, thanks, Steve. Appreciate it very much. <coughs> uh, before we get started, I wanna make sure I have everybody um, be able to raise your hand. Down to the bottom of your screen, you'll see participants is now at 98. You click on that, you'll see where you can raise your hand with the list there. I've got two up right now with their hands. Uh, Bill, AA, Bill AA6F, um, you wanna, you're the first, I believe. You wanna take it away? Hello, Bill. Here we go, that's better. Okay, this is Bill, AA6FC, San Jose. Um, how do you get involved with uh, FEMA at all uh, to, to do something like this, to get trained and and be ready for when they call. Uh, as a as a shares member, uh, you are uh, tied to an agency. Mm -hmm. uh, some shares members are tied to agencies that are members. I mean, some volunteers are tied to agencies that are members. Some volunteers are work directly with shares as <coughs> auxiliary <coughs> members. Uh, mm -hmm. I would, th would like to defer that question to Ross Merlin because I didn't summon these people. He did. Okay. Hi, this is Ross. How's my audio? Hi, Ross. We can hear you. Okay. Go ahead, so, Ross. First of, all, first of all, this is not FEMA, right? FEMA oh. is a different part of Department of Homeland Security. We work with them, but we're not under them. They're not under us. So, as Steve said, the, your opportunity here is through an agency that's a member. 
Okay. There are 750,000 ham radio operators in the U.S., and there's four people in my office. There's no way we could manage that large a group of volunteers, uh, the, the okay. percentage of hams that would want to get involved. So let's say you have the power company or the telephone company or a county emergency management agency in your vicinity. If they're a member of SHARES and they have a relationship, or you have a relationship with them, they might ask you to be, to operate that radio for them. Okay. I, I'm, not, I'm not recruiting you directly because then I would be competing against the local agencies right. for their own resource, that's you. That wouldn't be right. fair to them. Where we do have volunteers in the program, it's, the, the role for them is as relay stations or as administrative or operational support, net control operators, okay. working group leaders, and, and so on. And, and we have a large number of those over a thousand uh, from them being either Mars members or other federal agencies, Civil Air Patrol, um, Coast Guard Auxiliary, uh, or retired feds who worked in HF radio. See, that's not our target audience, the individual volunteer. This system exists for those who originate or receive national security or emergency preparedness communications. And that's not you or me at home in our shack. Our right. opportunity is to relay for those guys who actually have that official communication. So I need more of the agencies in the program and I have a large number of volunteer hams to do the, the relay and, and the other functions. Now, an exception to that is someone who brings a unique skill, something that we're in need of. If you remember the map Steve had up before, um, we don't have a lot of share stations in uh, Utah, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, that, mm -hmm. that part of the country. If you are volunteering to be an RMS gateway station on the shares frequencies and can commit to very high reliability, availability, then we'll register you as an individual volunteer directly into that NCC auxiliary program. So, you know, we're like, uh, unlike some other programs, we're not looking to, to get our numbers inflated so that we look to be more effective. We have to maintain a balance between how much we can support and uh, we're okay. doing very well. We've, we've doubled the size of the program in the last five years, but they didn't increase the we just lost your sound. Um, hey, uh, if I was with the Red Cross locally, would that be, <clears throat> would that get me involved if, if the need arose? Uh, if the Red Cross was a member of that particular chapter, was uh, mm -hmm. uh, filled out a Form 1 and was a SHARES member, uh, okay. that particular hospital or that particular uh, uh, county agency, uh, and they okay. uh, requested that uh, uh, call signs, and they gave you a call sign to use uh, mm -hmm. in the F uh, well, uh, for some purpose. Sure. Okay, I'll get in touch with the Red Cross, and I got some friends at the county too. So, county the county EMA would be absolute dream. Uh, and uh, we got on here uh, Jim Price who's the uh, auxiliary liaison for Cal OES, who has shares all over the place, runs RMSs. Uh, he, can, he could help you with that, maybe. Um, all right, what, what is Jim, what's Jim's call? What is Jim's call sign? I have no idea. Oh, okay, Contact no problem, him. I'll Contact find him. Kilo six. I'm sorry? Kilo, Kilo Oscar Six Golf Mike. Got it. All right, very good. Thank you, gentlemen. Sure. Hey, uh, Gordon, you want to pick it up at this point? The sure. Just a little... Yes, sir. Good, good evening, everybody. And uh, Steve, thank you for a wonderful presentation. Um, I, I don't know if this is a question for you or for Ross, but um, we've seen situations where having a you know, a VHF or UHF capability to complement the HF's capability is useful. Now, we as a company, I work for at and for instance, and have a shares station uh, assignment. Um, but I'm thinking that, that we've had situations where 
we, where we've used our Part 90 licenses, but there are limits as to what you can do there too that don't apply on the HF side in shares. So it might be useful, and I'm wondering if there's any thought given to having a VHF or UHF channel set uh, for various functions uh, within the shares program. Ross, you want to take that and then let me uh, take it also. You there, Ross? Yeah, okay. I'm on you now. Yeah, so in the federal radio spectrum near any major city, it's extremely congested. It, it is impossible to get a nationwide channel designated for shares use. In specific locations, I could probably get a, a channel assigned, it would most likely be in the 162 to 174 megahertz band or in the 406 to 420 megahertz band. So if you needed that for your shares operation, you contact me with the specifics, latitude and longitude and power and, and so on, um, we could submit a request for frequency assignment. But uh, un unlike some other programs that appear to have nationwide channels, we don't have that at VHF or UHF. Uh, sure. now, yeah. One thing I'd like to bring up is that sure. uh, uh, do you have, you said you had part 90, you have FCC uh, channels. You could take yes. a, a, a great example would be an or, a, a county or a state or a, any agency that is moving from VHF, UHF to trunking, 800 trunking, for example. And you may have some spare FCC channels that uh, are still sure. available with your agency that you could uh, request uh, from the FCC a mode designator change and uh, either use that uh, on digital for if you wanted that or for WinLink or whatever you wanted to do with it. Uh, that's where it would be most likely on WinLink uh, where you can, in the middle of downtown San Jose is a hard place to operate HF. So I'm well, totally sympathetic and understand that. And the answer is uh, that is another option that's available. Uh, and I've, propose that to several states. Um, there are uh, possibilities in certain areas where we can uh, work with other agencies to obtain channels like that. Uh, depends on where it is. Ross uh, is a former spectrum manager for the United States of America, so uh, he's a perfect person to ask. I don't ask. Thank you. Mm -hmm jump in here for a second. I got a message here from Marv uh, Hoffman. I don't have his call sign. And he is saying that uh, uh, to get involved, ever SEC should contact the WIC, the um, w SWIC, Statewide Interoperative Coordinator. Every state and territory has one. And then, uh, so can you elaborate on that there, um, Steve? Well, in South Carolina, excuse me, Yes, in South Carolina and North Carolina, uh, that is a strong possibility. In other states, the statewide interoperability coordinator is not so familiar with communication. Their job is to take, uh, among other things, uh, funds from the government, uh, federal government, uh, in the form of a technical assistance catalog, choose courses like COMEL, COMT, OXCOM, 300, 400, and determine how many times and when those courses will be offered and make certain that uh, he satisfies the needs of his uh, ESF2s and others, other ESF functions, um, hazmat, whatever. But uh, uh, my advice would be uh, to, if you don't get a response from the statewide interoperability coordinator, I would write both the statewide interoperability coordinator the director of the emergency management agency, as well as the person that's designated as the ESF2 or the communication manager. That communication manager is going to be the one that needs your service, whether it be a county or a state, whether it be a hospital or anywhere else, I would first approach the person whose function is closest to what it is you're trying to provide. Does that make sense? It does to me. Um, okay, that, is there any other follow-up on that question? Sure, if not, where we'll are you, on. Where, 
I can't, I can't see where you are. Where, where are you from? Where do you live? Marv, I think he's talking to you. Marv Harfman? No, no. Who, uh, somebody asked him the question. Who asked the question? Asked the question. That is who asked the question. I, he didn't have his call sign there. Uh, so I was just saying, Marv, are you on there? You want to comment back? Okay, well now, um, I didn't post the question. I commented about the question from, but I don't know who it was that posed, how do you get involved? So perhaps somebody can, Step or up. that individual can respond again. But, uh, that, was, that was me, gentlemen. Okay, Bill. there you are. Oh, hey, there's your answer. Okay, uh, great. Thank you. Appreciate sure. it. Sure, I'm, um, yeah. Uh, a lot, a lot of the, you know, here's what it reminds me of. I talked to a lot of hands today. I don't know anybody over there. Uh, they're, they don't want to talk to me, et cetera, et cetera. It reminds me when I was a young, uh, when I was a, a, I was a director of development for Vanderbilt University many years ago. And uh, that was raising money. And uh, I'd sit across a, a table at a club uh, from a multi-zillionaire being a very young man and uh, say to myself, well, you know, if I ask this man and he rejects me, or the same thing with the, when I was dating ladies, if I ask this lady and she rejects me, I'm gonna go, I've got two options. One, I can go home and take a Valium, pull the shades down and feel sorry for myself. Or I can look at myself and say, look, the worst thing that could happen is that everything stays the same, but I have information. Now, you're not gonna, the agency's not gonna come begging for assistance. You have to show them what it is that you can do. You have to let them know that you're well, those two statements I made from Hank Keebler and, and uh, uh, many, many others, and, and uh, uh, Mike Harris, uh, the ESF2 for Tennessee Emergency Management Agency, and many, many others, uh, you have to, uh, let them know that you're savvy to the fact that you are there because you have a particular skill set and you're willing to get gain many more skill sets that they may wish to uh, impose on you or edu they're going to educate you if they if they find you you're valuable they'll educate you it's the same thing with the equipment well they won't pay for anything well that's because you haven't sold them on the value of the service if you sell them on the value of the service, it costs them nothing. I mean, nothing. Uh, an agency that's got a hundred handheld in a suitcase, in suitcases in a cache in the back of a closet somewhere that they use on occasion is not going to spend a fourth of one of those for a, a station. That means they don't see the value in the service that you want to provide. I hope that helps. So getting getting uh, you know manning up womaning up and go, and going up and talking to those agencies and offering what you have uh, I wouldn't do it as a, a a club or an organization I wouldn't put any branding on it uh, you know I'm here with my group and I'm in charge that doesn't that doesn't work uh, uh, there's a big difference between concept and experience between reading that menu and eating that meal uh, and uh, they know for the most part where you're coming from and they just have to be convinced that uh, you're a dry sponge and they're water okay appreciate that uh, we got a message from ray uh, w7ci ray if you hold off a little bit i want to try to get some of these other hands here um W2ROS, Ros Roski, I think it is. You want to take it away? Hi, good evening, Steve. Rosky Slip with W2ROS with Red Cross in Connecticut, Rhode Island. Thanks for the email exchanges we've had. Sure. Uh, you asked that somebody remind you about the interoperability between the uh, uh, shares on the government side versus the amateur side and passing oh. uh, traffic between two services. Okay, very simple. Uh, I cannot use my amateur call sign on the shares frequencies. I cannot use my shares call sign on the amateur frequencies. I can send a message to W2 
ROS from NCS 396, I uh, put the, uh, because I am identifying as a shares station on shares channels. You are identifying as an amateur station on amateur channels so that interchange is possible that way. So to give you an, a, a simple, the simplest example, uh, Jim Price, uh, KO6CGM, who's a Cal OES uh, uh, liaison for this type of thing, has a monthly net. And that monthly net, you have all month to check in on to WGY, whatever it is, nine, whatever it is, at winlink.org. I can check in as a share station and go to a shares RMS, or I can check in as a uh, uh, ham station and go to a ham RMS. Um, and it doesn't matter. He gets the information. He knows by the call sign which is which. Now with Winlink, if you try to use a, a, light, a, a, a call sign on the ham bands that's not registered with the FCC as an appropriate license, you've had it until you notify us and let us know, you'll get a message uh, saying that uh, your license has expired is the 90% of that. Uh, people don't realize the license has expired and all of a sudden, what do you mean? And they check it and their license has expired. Uh, in the United States, that's a big problem. Um, in other countries, it's piracy. But in the United States, don't have that issue. Um, same with shares. If you uh, get on shares and you are not registered in the shares database, you get a message and you get, uh, you, you, that's it. You're not on there any longer until you uh, uh, produce evidence that you are actually a, a shares member. Uh, so, and that's between you and the shares office or that's between you and the FCC. Uh, so, um, that's how that works. Uh, I didn't want to sit and explain all that. Uh, because it was out of context with what I was saying at the time, but I knew that it was a question that merited some consideration. Thank you very much. Sure. Anybody have any technical questions? I have Phil shared here, W4PHS, who wrote 90% of the current WinLink programs and designed the network somehow. Uh, I think he cheated and got it from some scientist somewhere, but he wrote the network, uh, the radio only network, which is a brilliant piece of uh, code. Okay, I'll jump in here for a moment. What about the 60 meter band? The who band? 60, 60 meter band. What about it? Had, did you touch on that before? I missed it if you did. Oh yeah. Uh, well, yeah, that, uh, Ross, you wanna take that? about the 60 meter five channel secondary ham use? Okay, so when, when I was uh, at SEMA, I put federal government frequency assignments right on the amateur radio secondary use channels there. Now the rule for that band has always been it's federal government first and amateur second. But by putting frequency assignments lining up with the amateur assignments, now we made it possible for federal government stations to know about these channels, to program them in their radios, and to plan for interoperability with amateurs. Now, the, a, a strict interpretation of Part 97 says amateur stations may only speak to other amateur stations and to the International Space Station, except RACES. A US, a, a US amateur station operating in RACES can communicate with a federal government station. That's only likely if you're on the same channel. The FCC has interpreted, but will not put in writing, that for the five channels at 60 meters, any amateur station engaged in emergency communications, and that includes tests or exercises, may communicate with US government station for that purpose. So you can't do ham chit chat with a government guy, you know, if a government guy wants to do that, he needs to get a ham license. But if you're legitimately involved in emergency communications, including tests and exercises, you can speak to a, a US government station. Normally when that's done for a test, it's coordinated through the FEMA frequency manager and he'll put out 
uh, an announcement and ask the AWRL to post on their website that that use is authorized so any ham who's not sure about it can go somewhere uh, authoritative to check on it. Uh, it one thing for us. The, uh, the, the, uh, the FCC, the, the part 97 rules of the FCC are, are obviously antiquated. A lot of them were written uh, when there was no cell service, no satellite service, not much of anything other than AT&T high seas and globe wireless and WLO, uh, HF radio, et cetera. And uh, they didn't want competition. So if you notice part 97.113, you are not allowed to operate on a continual basis when you can use another service. Well, obviously in today's world, uh, that's all the time. Uh, there are other rules that are similar to that, that if the FCC starts screwing around with one of them, they've got to screw around with all of them and they just don't have the resources nor the time now in the wireless division to do that. At least that's what I hear. Someday. Okay. <laughs> oh, thanks. Uh, if we're ready, we'll take another one. Um, Jim Fuller, N7 VR. Okay, thanks, Dan. Uh, Ross, this I'm going to point towards your direction. Uh, up here in Montana, we have a real fun time trying to get shares, even to uh, licenses and so on. Uh, I was talking with Chris and and Tam and so on up at the state EOC, because I'm on the state EOC board up here. And we put in requests for them and all, all we get back for responses is there's no licenses available for Montana. What? And yet we only have, as far as I can find, one to two stations in the entire state. And that and and one of the stations, thank goodness, is our state OC at Helena. But we wanted one down in Billings and we we've tried to put together a plan for this and we're trying to get shares licenses. And we've been applying through the state and through the county uh, emergency deals. So we need somebody we can talk to that I can have, let those guys talk to to get someplace will you with call, this. Or you, you, you can contact me tomorrow, and uh, by uh, within two weeks, I'll have every everything you want for any county, right, so, state, so, whatever. But, but, but where yeah, do you so where problem? have you been calling? Well, we're in Montana. No, okay, but who this have is you a, been trying to contact? Well, we uh, I don't know who Tam and Chris who uh, Chris is the state communications or coordinator and Tam is the uh, SEC, uh, SEC, SEOC. Uh, he's the director of the state emergency coordination operation up there at Helena. So I don't know who they've been talking to, but they've been telling me that when they try to get sheriff's licenses, they're not able to get them. So it's very easy if, to do. If, if they on. submit the application to the sheriff's office, uh, it's usually processed in one or two business days. Right. So it sounds like you're requesting this from a state official who is not submitting the application to our office. If it's a state no, EOC no, what, what, what were you get, EOC, What we're no getting question. back, Ross, what we're getting back, Ross, is a letter stating that there's no shares, uh, shares licenses available for the state of Montana, any further shares licenses Jim, for the state from, of Montana. You're, you're, you're talking to the wrong from, people. You're talking to the wrong people. Talk you're, to Steve. You, listen, uh, you're, Jim, you're not talking to the sheriff's office. They're not talking to the sheriff's office. Okay. There, there is then I no need that address. Of availability. There is no question of availability of licenses. There's no quota. There's no rationing. If, okay. if they have a policy decision and they require counties to go through the state, that's an internal government. Do you, do you know Dan Hawkins? Ass. Do you know Dan Hawkins? Who runs well, Dan, Hawkins, D Dan, Dan Hawkins is over in the state communications, but he's not part of the emergency communications. Well, he is no longer. He's Chris is up. Chris is the the. It took Dan Hawkins' place. Dan Hawkins, Dan Hawkins has been gone from the state forever. He was the EOC uh, district emergency coordinator for the FEMA region you're in, um, and now he's retired. But um, if you will contact K4CJX at comcast.net 
and uh, give me the name of the person, the people that uh, you have been dealing with in either county, state, or any other government agency or non-government agency. I will get that done for you pronto. Okay, I'll get, I'll give I'll, I'll I'll do that, and I'll give Chris, uh, copy Chris and Tam on that, so that we get all three of us get to talking to you. We we we. And I'm, I'm going to put my I'm putting my contact info in the chat window, so you can copy it from there. You can call me uh, if you have any questions on on our end for processing that, or if the people you're dealing with are unsure of the procedure, please have them call me. Okay, that's appreciated. We've been trying to do this now for a few years and we're not getting very far <laughs> okay i have a hunch that uh, that same offer goes to other people that are trying to do the same thing and run into walls so you send a steve or a ross a email they'll they'll straighten it out for you and maybe point the right direction the, the last page of the presentation has lost ross's information and my information uh they all they have to do is fill out a one page piece of paper that i'd be happy to lead them through uh, and uh, get it right the first time, and they send that piece of paper off. They determine how many call signs they want, what type of call sign they want, what activities they want to participate in, et cetera, uh, to a certain extent, and then uh, they will get their call signs back, and it's a done deal. It's a very simple process. I've never heard ever shares turning an agency down for anything. So somebody's giving you the bum steer or you're not interpreting it correctly, something's wrong there because uh, I, will, I, would, I will crawl to Montana, to get shares into Montana. It's an area where there's a void. Uh, in my professional career, I had the state of Montana, uh, the, the deputy commissioner and the then person that was ahead head of uh, telecommunications, Carl Hotbit, um, a very good friend of mine still. I visit him every summer uh, and He's, uh, I'm sure that there is a breakdown in communication, but it's not between the state and the sheriff's office. And okay. Anywhere else in this. Okay. State. Sounds good. Thank you. And so we are clear. All righty. Uh, Jim Price, I think you're up next. All right, good. Uh, Jim Price from California, uh, Governor's Office of Emergency Services. Couple of things I'd just like to mention, uh, just to reiterate, the sheriff's licenses are issued to agencies, not to people. And so what, what you need to do uh, is convince your agencies uh, that uh, shares is a tool that would help them. And, we do, and we're doing it on the state level too. We're going out to our counties and convincing them that shares is a tool that they could use. Uh, I'll give you an example. We had a public safety power uh, shutoff uh, due to um, uh, heavy wind conditions in the fall. And uh, I was asked to go on our, uh, v, uh, our HF um, net frequency, our amateur frequency, and there was a contest. And I was completely unable to, to contact anyone because there was a contest. Well, if we had shares and we had lots of counties in shares and particularly shares ALE, and we've had very good luck with shares ALE, that wouldn't have been a problem. So it's a tool. It's a tool that the counties uh, and the states and the agencies can use. And, um, there should be no trouble getting a license. It's a form one. It's easy to fill out. Uh, Steve or um, Ross can help. Steve can help with that. And uh, the other thing I'd like to say is we are moving more and more people onto Winlink. Uh, Oliver um, Dully, K6OLI, who had to drop off, he told me uh, a couple of days ago that in an exercise they had, they had. Uh, uh, 17 requests, hospital requests done uh, via voice, of which 12 were, re were rejected as being incomplete. They had 26 um, statuses given over Winlink. All of them were accepted. And there are all kinds of forms now in Winlink uh, to address uh, those issues. 
So that's all I had. Thanks a lot, Dan. Not a problem, Jim. No problem at all. Uh, let me go up here and see who's next, um, unless uh, Steve's got a follow-up. Uh, he's not moving, so apparently he has no follow-up to that. Tom, and for TAB, I like your call sign. Take her away. Hey, folks. Uh, this is Tom in North Carolina. I guess everybody knows we have a poster child for hurricanes and God knows what else, and the RNC and some changes down here that are taking place. One of the things, the only thing I want to say is that within the ham community, within the ARES, that, and, it's, and, and the word is amateur radio emergency, it doesn't mean walks and runs and parade service, emergency service. You need to have a relationship with your county or your state or wherever the authority having jurisdiction lies, not a national publishing organization. I'm not beating up the league. I'm just saying this. If you don't know who your emergency manager is and don't eat lunch with him once in a while or her and work in, work in this environment, you're not going to get anywhere. And you can't come in there and say, I'm bringing this and I'm, I won't say where this came from. I got a phone call, I guess it was about two months ago, from an SEC in a state. And he said, he had gone to their EMA when the state he was in, big state too, and uh, he said, we can teach your Oxcom classes. We can teach your COMEL classes. I, I said, for God's sake, tell me you didn't say that. So you can't go in these places and say, I'm going to do this for you. You have to go in and say, what would you like for me to do? And then when they tell you what to do, go do it and come back the second time and say, I've got that accomplished. What else might, might I help you do? Don't bring in a box of goodies and put them on the table. They don't care. You gotta be 100% NIMS ICS compliant. You've gotta understand what the structure is. DECs, ECs, none of that makes any difference. It may make difference in a walk and running parade in a state government, it makes no difference whatever. You've gotta to belong to them and be part of it. If you do that, uh, you will have a very successful uh, uh, response. They're going to put you to work, and you're going to go, go in terrible places and do things and get in the mud and the blood, but that's what you signed up for. And thanks very much, Dan. This is a lovely, wonderful opportunity to hear all this tonight. Uh, we have uh, nine uh, RMSs in, 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 uh, in, uh, uh, in North Carolina, all shares, and, and, a, and a big deal. It's a big deal here because we live here. Thanks very much, and thanks everybody for tolerating me. Out. All right, thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, I think we'll pick up Charlie uh, KJ4DEE -E next, North Carolina, Eastern North Carolina. Uh, good evening to the group. Um, just want to echo off of Tom, and I'm glad he went before me because he's considered the Godfather of Oxcom in North Carolina. Um, one thing to address the man in uh, California that was asking how to get started. Um, Tom just alluded to it, is don't show up and knock on the door of your EOC. Prepare yourself by going ahead and getting online, going to homelandsecurity.gov, and getting MIMS certification. Get your 100, get your 200, get your 700, get your 800, things you can do online. Get familiar with the National Incident Management System. Then take those credentials and go ask what you can do, because you're not going to get in the door if you're not even credentialed in some of those areas. But then later on, if you need to get 300 and 400 for some of the level that you're working at or working with, um, you can do that. But go ahead and anybody can go ahead and start their 100s, their 200s, the NCIS 200s, um, the 700s, 800, 812, the what, 802s or whatever it takes now. Um, go ahead and go online and look at those and become NIMS compliant, as Tom just said, and uh, start there and then offer yourself out and then you'll be getting calls. And this needs to go anywhere. And that's really just all I wanted to reiterate. The young man that was asking, where do I need to start? How do I get involved? Um, start there. And then you have something that you can build on. Oh, well, I am NIMS compliant. I have been exposed to this. Then you can, then you're ready to say, okay, well, come in, let's talk. Then you'll be ready. All I have, 73 guys. You know, one, one, one point of access would be to call an agency and say, where can I take classroom course? I see 300. I already have. Uh, my four uh, qualifying 
uh, online courses from FEMA and I want to take uh, IC 300 and COMEL, how do I go and call or COMT, how do I go about that? And then, I mean, that's a great introduction. The thing is, um, when you take those courses, you are in there with the people who are in the agencies that you want to work with. And in those courses, you do a lot of team building. You do a lot of uh, work together, uh, solve problem solving together. And when you leave, uh, they know who you are and they know you know who they are. And uh, they're, not so, they're not so foreign to you. The, getting acquainted during a disaster is not the way to do it. Okay, um, I think we'll pick up uh, Steve W four N H O in Kentucky. Uh, good evening, everyone, and uh, uh, thanks, Steve, for his presentation. I want to just sort of uh, add to what he's talking about in Kentucky. We are assembling many, many WinLink licenses uh, through the hospitals. They've applied, been apparently been accepted. Uh, they're spreading across the state, and we are putting in the RMS locations. We have a VHF windlink uh, system in western Kentucky, and it's growing rapidly as we add to that. So the idea of not being able to get windlink devices, like I said, is not really true because we are adding them very quickly in, in Kentucky, and it's growing, and the state is very interested in moving WinLink forward and they're, they're glad to see what's happening, especially at the medical services uh, in installing them in their hospitals. Yeah, one, one thing I might uh, add, Steve, and that is uh, the ad huge advantage you have on the share system is that you don't have restrictions, uh, not particularly HIPAA restrictions, but any restriction. They can put anything they want on, they can password protect it, with a word file, a zip file, uh, they can use a, they can use encryption. Uh, they can do whatever they need to do without any uh, issue whatsoever on the shares channels. We're on the hand bands. Everything that's sent, voice, data, any transmission in the United States that's sent is open to the public. Yes, sir. So, uh, any if anybody there. Any agency there, any hospital there has a desire to get into shares uh, further than they are, or please contact me. We're working with you right now, from what I understand, and uh, we re really appreciate your service. Sure. All righty, uh, Robert, I look like you got a shares call sign on there. Go ahead. Oh, I did that in honor of Steve. Hey, Steve, greetings from Illinois. Is He's this Robert Littler? Hey, you know it is. You know oh, it I is. <laughs> I wanted to say thanks to you and uh, Ross and, uh, for jumping in and going over all this. I think you could probably do this in your sleep. In fact, I, I'm sure you can. But it's a great presentation. I'll be using the video here with the, with the Aries people out throughout Illinois and get drum up some more business. We're, uh, you didn't mention QSEC, but that's okay. Well, uh, I'm going to call you about QSEC here next week. And sure. We'll see if we can get that uh, fired up. People even. that don't know, QSEC is the Central United States Earthquake Consortium, which is an eight state consortium along the New Madrid Fault, which is the major concern uh, of most of those agencies, uh, most of those state agencies. Um, and there is a, a lot of work that's being done uh, with uh, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, Kentucky. Tennessee, Arkansas, Alabama, Mississippi, et cetera, uh, and associate uh, uh, nearby uh, states as well uh, on the devastation and how to deal with uh, a, a mass casualty event as a result of a hurricane. And uh, some states are very active, some states are. Uh, Robert uh, has a RMS in the state EOC in Springfield and uh, a couple of others uh, along the way, in addition to that, uh, all on shares. 
I'm sorry, Listen. Robert. Go ahead. No, not a, not a, not a problem. I was also going to give a shout out to Phil. Thank you, Phil, for making Win Like what it is today. I haven't been able to get my 7500 back online. Hopefully, someday it's going to do CWID. That was, I haven't tested it lately since the latest couple of loads, but it's, okay. my, uh, <laughs> my 7400 doesn't ID, but that's okay. We'll work that out. But uh, thanks again, everybody, for uh, for coming up and talking about this. And I think we need to uh, spread the word even farther and down the chain here throughout the Aries organization. Got a. a, a a man on here. I'm looking at his face right now. Ed WB4 RHO, uh, RHQ, who's the Tennessee vice, who's the Delta division vice director. That means very little to me. What means more to me is that he is in charge of the, he's the EC for the amateur radio emergency, uh, ARL, what's called W cares, the Williamson County amateur radio emergency service. And he has done a marvelous job in, pulling uh, hams that don't have much of a experience at all in this, this subject into uh, this subject, uh, starting out with having them go listen to sirens, uh, the, the county sirens to make certain that they're operating properly. Um, out of that pool, there is a reserve of about 22 people, of which he is now a member. And uh, he is a, uh, uh, You'd never know that he was the vice director of the ARL because it doesn't come up. What comes up is what the agency wants. And that's how it's got to be. Um, so uh, kudos to Ed. Thank you, Steve. All right. One, yes. last, uh, one, one last thing for, for Phil and, and the entire uh, Windlink team. Thanks for doing all the work on the uh, – American Red Cross template updates to the last minute because that really worked out on that uh, Red Cross exercise a couple of weeks that, back. Uh, that's done by Greg. What's Greg's name uh, and call, uh, Jim? Uh, the guy that does the templates, Greg? Uh, can yeah, you that's know? Greg Krukowit. Uh, right, uh, California. 7SJT. I think he's on here somewhere. <laughs> yeah, I've never spoken to him. I, did, uh, I thought I'd leave doctor. him alone. I know Mike Burton and you and others deal with him. Yeah, he's a su super good guy. And, you know, he used to be a first-grade teacher, so he can write stuff that all of us can understand. <laughs> There's, <laughs> a lot to my presentation. There's a lot to it, that. It, 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 you should have given my presentation. <laughs> you need to speak to the lowest denominator. And I hope there that that person on the ladder off that lift truck is not you. I did that because actually that's been cut back. There, underneath the bucket truck is a, is a raging stream of water. It's the best picture I've ever seen. I might have to say hi. Okay. Somebody's talking back there. All right. Uh, let's send over to Phil. Phil, W4PHS, you want to take it? Hey, guys. Uh, Steve, did, you did a good job, Steve enjoyed it. I was just going to uh, emphasize a couple of things that have been brought up and, and expand on them just a little bit. Certainly, uh, uh, I, th I think that the point that relationships are key has been made over and over again, and I will uh, uh, endorse that. If relationships are what it's all about. People, one of, our, one of my friends uh, and Steve's friends, Mike Harris, uh, has a saying, which is, when times are good, people work with people they know. When times are bad, people work with people they know. If they don't know you, it's highly unlikely they're going to use you during an incident. So develop the relationships during good times. Uh, the second thing I wanted to bring up was the interoperability uh, component of WinLink. A question came up earlier on about hams communicating with shares people. And I want to expand on that just a little bit. Yes, a, a, a ham operating on ham frequencies with WinLink can address a message to a shares call sign and have this, the message picked up by a shares user who is connecting on shares frequencies and the, the reverse can, is, is true also. But it doesn't end there. Because WinLink can send email to any email address, any internet email address, you have internet, you have interoperability with essentially anyone in the world. 
you can send an email from some location uh, into the WinLink system and have a person in who uh, God knows where, somewhere in Africa or in Europe, pick it up by email and they can reply. They don't even have to be AM or shares member. They can reply and that email comes back to the, to the um, sender, whoever it is, ham or shares. So the interoperability is universal. I, will, I would make the, the argument that there is no communication system that has more interoperability than WinLink because you can reach anyone in the world that has email. Uh, the second thing is hardware interoperability. And we've had people on who, of course, talk about HF radio, but also some talking about VHF, VHF radio. Whether you're connecting to WinLink by a VHF or HF, your messages go into the common message server and someone else using a different piece of hardware can pick them up. So you've got hardware interoperability between all sorts of different devices. And the third thing is time independence. <clears throat> when you're operating in an emergency situation, often you can't be on the air 24 seven. There may be power issues. There may be simply uh, times when you're busy or are moving around from one location to another. If, you, if you're using a phone connection over HF radio, both operators have to be on the air with their radios on at the same time. With WinLink, you can send a message and it's held until the recipient has an opportunity to pick it up, which could be hours later. And they can reply and then when you're available, you pick it up. So the time independence is very important for emergency communication. And the final thing is accuracy. You simply cannot send emergency communication using a system that doesn't guarantee 100% accuracy. If you're calling for a life flight pickup to uh, uh, take an injured person to a hospital or medical care, and the message you send gets corrupted in a digit, the helicopter may go to the wrong state. You've got to have the latitude and longitude correct if you want to have the helicopter come to your location. So accuracy is essential. The same thing sending a list of orders for medical supplies. You know, a corrupted digit, you may get diapers instead of penicillin. It's got to be 100% accurate, and WinLink guarantees 100% accuracy. So I think for a lot of reasons, uh, WinLink is an obvious choice for people who are engaged in emergency communication. And I guess one final thing, and that would be redundancy. The fact that WinLink is a distributed system with RMSs all over the country, if one of them is down, just call a different one. You don't have to go to a specific one. So you've got enormous redundancy. And we and, and on the central system, we've got two ser servers, which are 100% redundant, located on computers in the Amazon cloud, but one on the West Coast and one on the East Coast to provide additional reliability. So overall, we've been up 99.999%, or maybe it's more than that, maybe another digit, over the last 15 years, and I'll put that up against any system of any type. If anybody has any technical questions, I'll be happy to answer them while I'm on. Anybody have any questions for, for uh, on that? I even raised my hand. Uh, I, yeah. I do. I do too. Well, okay, let's, uh, let's get our hands up. Well, okay, if you got questions to him, go ahead. Um, Dan, I think you said something first. You got you got questions there? I'll I'll be a gentleman or try to be and defer to Lee first, but I want to ask Phil a question. Okay. Nicely. Hello, Lee. Oh yeah, thanks. Um, is the Mill Standard 110A in your toolkit also? It is not. No, it is not. Is that, is there more there, Lee? I, I wanted to answer. Nope, that was it. I've done interoperability with that, uh, with that um, modem hard software. I want to answer I that just, question, if I may. Because uh, yeah. that's a broader question than just 110 Alpha. It also includes other FEC protocols, uh, forward error correction, which are point to multipoint which means that you do not know who the receiving stations are 
uh, which means the receiving stations cannot on a packet by packet frame uh, uh, ask for a resend or a repeat. Uh, there's no knacking and acking. It is not a, an ARQ protocol or an OFDM protocol. Um, and um, we use modes that are, um, that are true data, one-to-one -one data uh, transfer protocols like ARQ. There is FEC in PACTOR, but uh, that's just in incidental. The point is that when you're dealing with human lives and property, to not know who the receiving stations are or who's listening and to not know whether that station has completed a transmission until you hear from a station that you may not even know is there. Uh, we don't do that. Um, that would not be acceptable uh, to a professional agency. Uh, it, it, it's, it's done in Mars because who can afford the Steneg ARQ protocols? So uh, to answer your question, we uh, just, don't, just don't do that. Yeah, in combination with ALE, it worked pretty well, but I get your point. Okay. And okay. you're also talking about uh, uh, specific recipients uh, that may be email addresses and other, you know, a mixture of, of, of radio and email, a mixture of radio, email, ham, and shares, or any other organization uh, that has uh, uh, that type of thing. So, um, it just doesn't have the, if the, listen, they're inexpensive. If they had the flexibility and the reliability we need, we'd be crazy not to do that. But the closest that we come to that and a, un, a less expensive protocol on the hand bands would be Vera or RDOP or Winmore. Um, RDOP and Winmore are, we developed for uh, the amateur who can't afford a $1,400 modem or doesn't want to spend the money. Or both. or both. Okay, uh, Dan, I, we're getting out of sync here and everybody's just sort of jumping in. Let's get back to raising hands. Can you raise your hand there, Dan, and I'll pick you up in a little bit. Uh, Phil, take it away, W4PHS. Uh, I don't, uh, was there a question pending for me? No, uh, you just had your hand up or maybe I didn't know. Oh, I'll, I'll, I'll lower it. <laughs> okay. Okay, super. Uh, Greg, KG6SJT. Uh, Uh, this is Greg. Yeah, I just because Jim Price had mentioned my name, I do the forms. I would put my hand up to jump in when I finally found where the hand was, and now I can lower it. I didn't mean to. Uh, let me turn on the camera for a second. Quick look, and then I, as soon as I find the hand again, I'll turn it off. Still looking, but anyway, hi to all. <laughs> Okay, did you have a comment that you want to say? No, it's not necessary. Now, I think everything's been said. The forms work quite well. Uh, they've helped out LA. They, they enter their forms and everything's um, somewhat verified to their, to their needs. So we try to make the forms useful to people. So take advantage. Okay, uh, Oliver bailed out earlier, giving away to some, let somebody people get on here. Oliver's over in LAX, and they use a lot of it. So San Diego, a lot of uh, uh, Wind League stuff and the forums that they're referring to. Very, very, uh, very good operation. Okay, Steve, uh, KX4EF, uh, uh, you know, go ahead. Thank you very much, Richmond, Virginia. I just wanted to add to Phil's interoperability comments that uh, you can actually send a text message to cell phones or a list of cell phones, and it can be either SMS or the larger format. And uh, from an alerting standpoint, that's a very, very powerful feature. Thank you. I don't see the hand raising anywhere on this. Oh, you have, you have to go click on your participants at the bottom. This is okay. participants 50, and then you'll see all the hands. Okay. okay. If, if there's nothing more there, I'll pick up, um, I'll pick up Kenny, KC4OJS. 
Yeah, uh, I've just got just a couple of quick comments building on what Phil had mentioned about the interoperability with WinLink. Uh, after Maria, I added a couple of things to my personal protocol that I will always use with WinLink. Uh, one is the uh, position report, and then go back 10 or 15 minutes later and search for nearby stations. That will tell me every person that's operating WinLink uh, around me, and if, and if everybody that's responding to disaster does the same thing, I immediately have a complete record of everybody in that network, and it's real time and available to me. Uh, the second thing is this, is uh, whenever I'm responding, getting ready to leave, it's a very important thing in WinLink. It's, 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 I didn't realize it till this, just this last few deployments, but is your address book. Um, reach out and get a hold of uh, everybody, anybody that you could possibly think that you might need to communicate with when you're deployed. I mean, state agencies, federal agencies, Red Cross, anybody, everybody, and load that address book up. And uh, whenever you're in the event, uh, if you need a specific resource or you know, some way to communicate with a specific agency, you have the address right there in the address book. And uh, I think that that might be a little overlooked. And then last but not least, I want to say thanks to, uh, to the WinLink team, to Phil, uh, you know, Steve. Uh, you guys have absolutely, absolutely uh, uh, been great for the, the agency that I volunteer with. And that's, that's Southern Baptist uh, Disaster Relief. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. That's all I got to say. Well, thank you. Uh, let's, uh, I'm going to... I don't want to put Dan off much longer because he had a question earlier. We don't want to get away from that subject too far. Go ahead, Dan. Take it away. KL seven CO. Uh, try whiskey, Lima seven. <laughs> okay. Your, for your kilo call. Uh, first of all, I, I I'm in awe of the company this evening, and it makes however many hours it has been that I've sat here at these meetings more than worth it. Uh, Steve, I I spent probably three, four hours trying to write a reply to your comments about NDIS, and I'm glad I didn't send it. Because uh, <laughs> there's a lot more to what's going on than uh, I would have been able to uh, effectively communicate to you. And Phil, there's no way the amateur radio community is ever gonna be able to thank you enough. Specific question I had was, either I hallucinated it, just out of a strength of desire, or I heard something about um, when Link was actually gonna uh, become a multi OS fully featured package rather than the hit and miss that we've been trying to play with with only partial success for years. Can you comment if there is a uh, extra Microsoft Windows development process in place right now? Uh. Well, uh, the honest answer is there is not. We did have a, a, a pair of people who were uh, iOS developers who spent a couple of years trying to convert WinLink Express to run on uh, iOS devices, iPhones, iPads, and uh, they threw in the towel uh, a year or so ago and no one else has uh, picked up the, the, uh, the mantle. There are, uh, well, there, there are devices that run on microprocessors that do things that interconnect with WinLink, but there is no other, there is no project underway right now to port WinLink Express to any other operating system. So well, we still love you all the same. Thank you. Uh, there, Thank are, you. Uh, there are other groups, uh, and you can look on the WinLink support page that uh, play with other operating systems, but they have not produced uh, the same user-friendly uh, environment. One of the reasons why we are where we are is because that's where the agencies are. That's where the end user agencies are, okay? And that's where the boaters were before uh, Winlink was 90% maritime community many years ago when I got involved with the founder of Winlink, uh, Vic Poor. Uh, that's all that uh, people cared about and slowly uh, with Harbor Hot Spots and Iridium Go and other uh, less expensive uh, methodologies, um, the uh, maritime command and money that it takes to to do those things to to, to travel like that, uh, the maritime community has slacked way down in Winlink participation. It's still there, 
but the MCOM community from the amateur side has absolutely dominated WinLink for years now. Uh, that is one of the reasons why I'm here talking to the Amateur Radio Emergency Service because they're being trained. Uh, hams are being trained now and want, are interested in MCOM. It's the kind of world we're living in and uh, it's a good thing. Uh, the other uh, uh, thing I wanted to say is there are, there, when I got involved with WinLink, there was Vic Poor and Steve Waterman. And another man came along with Vic Poor, had to, had to leave the coding process named Hans Kessler. And then Rick Muthing came in and others have come in and they have done their particular expertise, ex like Phil, excellently. Uh, the person that runs the CMS system and wrote the code for that, excellent. But we're all volunteers. Uh, we're all doing this because we want to, just like you do when you work for an agency. You're not doing it because you get overtime. Uh, so you'll work anytime, day, night, weekends. Uh, we would love to, uh, and I'm so grateful for Greg. I've never met Greg or even spoken to him, but I hear him about him all the time. <clears throat> Mike Burton and Jim Price wear my ear out about Greg. Um, he does a great job. I've never even talked to him. Never, never had the opportunity to, to meet him. So uh, what I guess I'm saying is, if you're interested and you're a volunteer and you have expertise and you want to make a contribution to WinLink, uh, feel free to contact us and let us know. We welcome additions to, you know, we're getting on up there. We're going to be hitting our heads on the ceiling. <laughs> and when we do, we want to have replacements and people that we're that are mentoring with us that will continue this process indefinitely. So, uh, if you know people that have expertise, uh, please send them our way. That's how all of this happens. Okay, sounds good. Let's move on to Jim, and I'll come back with some other comments in a moment. Go ahead, Jim uh, Pierce. Price for I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, for um, Phil, thank you so much for your work on uh, getting uh, uh, Winlink uh, to work on the Codan Envoy radio. Really appreciate that, and that happened very quickly. Uh, another uh, comment on the address book, that can be exported. So if you have like your uh, computer in the EOC and you have another one that you might want to bring in the field, you can export that address book and put it into uh, uh, our contacts and put it into the other computer. So you're, you're up to date on both. My question, Phil, to you is, uh, do you know if, Co if Vera FM is going to be changed on um, June 30th as well as Vera HF? No, uh, the June 30th change is just the HF side. Uh, the VHF side is stable and will not change on the 30th. Great, thank you. That's all I had. Right. Uh, okay. Uh, I, go ahead. Like Dan, I friendly. wonder if I could make a, another comment or two while I'm on okay, here. Okay, Phil, I'll allow you. I, I, and I'll try to be brief here. I, and I don't want to get, uh, get us in the direction of spending a lot of time on technical features in Winlink because that's not purpose of this conference, maybe we could have another com another meeting where we, we focus on WinLink features and operational procedures. But I would encourage you to explore some of the, the less obvious features in our software, particularly WinLink Express, uh, just as someone discovered the position report and how it's handy. Uh, dig into it a little bit and you'll find there are some interesting things that you may not even be familiar with. For example, catalog requests where you can request real-time weather updates, satellite images, and lots of other things. Uh, and also uh, the ICS 309 message log generator, which generates a PDF of your message, all your message traffic log. There, there are a lot of features in there. As I said, I don't want to get into all that because we could go on for hours. But it's a very rich featured program, and it would, it, you know, when you're 
sitting around bored during the quarantine, you might spend an hour or so going through the different menus and researching some of the features that you've never tried before in Winlink Express and add them to your bag of tricks. Appreciate that, Phil. Um, see, I better get your, get your hand down since you just spoke. I see no more hands. Um, Steve, I want to make an offer to you because you would know best. When I send out the link to the video tonight, um, later tonight, I do it two ways. I can do it two ways. One is just to view it only, and I'm going to make that visible to everybody I can. I can also make it so uh, you can download it and uh, massage it for a YouTube video or something like that. If I was to send you the one with the link to be able to download it, to make it a YouTube, to clean it up, would you be able to get it to the folks in, your, in the organization there that want to do something with that? Steve? Um, yeah, uh, it might be a, a good thing to, uh, uh, for a training or for an introduction to, uh, to shares. Because um, I want to, uh, you know, this is not a Winlink uh, talk. This is a shares talk. Um, and the Winlink and shares, which is... I'm referring so to shares. Robust. I'm referring to shares. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, it's so okay. much more robust. Uh, I, I would uh, say that I can't, I don't have the expertise in massaging anything, but we have people that would. And, uh, uh, and I'll find out who they are. I've got a pretty good idea and beg them and see if they won't uh, uh, maybe either put that on YouTube or put it on the Winlink website. Um, okay. Ross, yeah. do you have the need for anything like this? Ross Merlin, do you have a need for anything like this? Sure. Yeah, we could we could post it on our his insight for for use within the uh, the program once it's edited. Thank you. Sure. All right, that's super. I'll get that to you so that you can get to the folks. Uh, maybe Phil can do something with it also. Whatever. Um, are there any more questions? I don't see any more hands up. We we started out with a hundred folks. We're uh, we're down to forty four. To me, that means there's 44 people dead serious about that, and there's a whole bunch of couldn't get in. I got a bunch of emails during the process of this, process of this. and so the, getting the word out after I send the, the video out, I think it's going to cover a pretty good audi audience. Are there any more comments or questions? Yeah, Dan, I've got a question, if I can. This this is Mike at W7B, and this is addressed to uh, to Steve wherever he went on my screen. Oh, there he is down there now. Um, I'm on the uh, board of directors, the ARRL, and I'm also on the band planning committee, and work rather hard to try to get you guys some more bandwidth for for Winlink. I hate to, to say this is a Winlink question, but you guys you you made a comment that perked my uh, interest up, and that has to do with the percentage of traffic, uh, Winlink traffic that is sailboat versus uh, uh, versus um, amateur traffic. And you said that the sailboat traffic has gone down, the, the amateur traffic has gone up. And uh, I'm just curious as to- The, 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 the MCOM traffic. The MCOM people, traffic. Yeah, yeah, people yeah. interested in emergency services. What's the, what's, the, what's the current ratio or what was, what was the ratio and what's the ratio now? Well, when we first started, there was no ratio. There were people that are interested in the maritime community uh, then, uh, uh, through people like Hank Keebler, uh, who is the chief of, uh, operations for Tennessee emergency management, David Wolf, who was the chief of communication and others that started uh, using this, uh, for, uh, real life, uh, emergencies, as well as, uh, providing exercises and putting it in the hands of volunteers, starting volunteer programs. Uh, counties all over the country started doing that. State governments all over the country started doing that. Uh, the Amateur Radio Emergency Service started doing that. Um, Oxcom started teaching about it. Uh, North Carolina took it very seriously. Uh, where, you, what, what state are you located in? I, I'm in Oregon. Oregon, uh, 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 Doug, uh, I can't think of Doug's last, can't pronounce it. Uh, your your uh, ESF two for the state Doug, Oregon Doug state Jimenez. Doug Jimenez mm -hmm. Jimenez uh, took it uh, is taking it seriously. Uh, your governor gave gave the or state of Oregon two hundred and fifty thousand dollars 
uh, to uh, spend on WinLink um, on the amateur side. So those things make a difference. Meanwhile, uh, when you go into a harbor, uh, you have a hot spot. There were no hot spots. There were just people complaining because you screwed up their television set uh, using WinLink. Our, 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 our RVs, we had over a thousand RVs. Uh, we don't have that anymore unless somebody's in the middle of Alaska or somewhere that cannot reach a cell service. Um, so to answer your question, the ratio now I would say is about 80% MCOM and 20% maritime. Okay. But, okay. Uh, now the, re just, the reason uh, I ask, the reason I ask is I have to constantly defend you guys, right? When we're talking about band band planning and allocations and, and finding additional bandwidth for, for wide band services. And, uh, I mean, the more information I have on that, the better it is, and the better I can I can help defend Winlink. As we, you're you, right, our our state has spent two hundred fifty thousand dollars to equip every one of our EOCs with uh, with uh, with a, a Winlink station. So that's one of the reasons they stuck me on the band planning committee as a director was because I had a I have skin in the game, right? And so uh, anyway, I, I want to appreciate I appreciate your uh, your comments and uh, look forward to uh, to learning more more. Uh, Maybe we can have a, say, a WinLink uh, presentation Dan can put together. I certainly appreciate yeah, it. Uh, you might want to talk to Kurt Bartholomew, in the, uh, who's the emergency manager for the uh, Public Safety and Homeland Division uh, branch of the Federal Communications Commission about what you just spoke about. Um, you know, rocks are hard, water's wet, and things change. <laughs> and uh, that's what's happening. And uh, as, as uh, we're... Former mentor David Sumner once told me many, many years ago, pipe down, wait, you're ahead of your time. Well, that's always a painful thing. And uh, I was just following my mentor, who was the uh, co-author of the single chip microprocessor, who wrote the first code to develop something called AppLink before Windows became uh, an operating system. It was called Amtor Packet Link. And we would take uh, Northwest packet networks and, and use Amtor, which is the amateur version of Cytor, uh, and send it across the world or across the country or across the state or across somewhere to other packet networks. So this was a natural evolution to Windows, a natural evolution to the internet, email system. Uh, same principle, uh, same, same things happening. So, uh, and any of us would be well, and we have been working with, with uh, your attorney and others to try and ban planning committee to attempt to uh, justify your positions. Uh, the resistance is always going to come. I'm, I'm old. I got my hand license in 1955. I'm 77. When I can plainly remember the same arguments, the same exact arguments when single sideband came in. You can't copy it. It's coded. It can't be read. It interferes with everything. That's stepping all over everything. Uh, that was the AM community. Okay, the same, the, the same thing occurs now. Um, and the, that's just the way amateur radio is. Progress well, is slow. Yeah, I've, I've been a big supporter of WinLink, and I will continue to be a big supporter of WinLink, WinLink among the among the board. So anyway, I just wanted to thank you for your uh, for your work with that, and thank you for your presentation this evening. Sure. Thanks, Mike. Uh, I might uh, add a little bit here on Mike. Mike's a director. He and uh, a few others that he's pretty close working with are the ones that's been instrumental in keeping uh, the band plan thing going for us. Um, getting them to recognize WinLink and other things that uh, we need to do within the ARRL. So for him and the other directors that are involved with that, I certainly extend my appreciation. Okay, Gus, you got a question. Take it away from Hawaii. Uh, yeah, hi, yeah, not, not so much a question, but just to, just to emphasize the point that Mike was making. Um, amateur radio shares the frequency spectrum among all of its stations to access WinLink. So there's going to be a, during a disaster. There's going to be a tremendous amount of health and welfare traffic trying to be passed over amateur radio in a shared basis. When I talk about WinLink to critical infrastructure here in Hawaii, uh, right now so far it's been the Hawaii Healthcare Emergency Management Center has taken on to to WinLink through shares channels. 
the way I explain it is kind of in a military way, shares provides assured access to the WinLink network for their purpose when it's a disaster and it's critical infrastructure. Amateur radio can't say that. I can't tell you with my ham radio, I'm going to give you assured access when you need it because I'm not allowed to, to, to you know, provide QRM or, or interfere with other stations that are already on the frequency. I have to sit and wait until something's available and I'll, my turn and then I can access and I may or may not get in. So amateur radio wind link is great and it's gonna, and it's gonna be a, a dire need for it for, for all the health and welfare, but for critical, critical infrastructure, the term we use is assured access. Uh, you know, I, I think it's a, it, there's a long way to go to talk about ham radio and assured access in the same in the same discussion. I think that that's quite a leap. Uh, can I make a comment uh, off of that? Sure, uh, go ahead. Uh, back in the day, uh, before there was a, a subband, uh, we formed a corporation uh, called a Delaware corporation called the Amateur Digital Radio Society, and the Amateur Digital Radio Society. Uh, had a leader uh, <clears throat> whose name was uh, Warren Sensheimer. And Warren Sensheimer was a communication attorney. He was also chairman of Ericsson Corporation, uh, retired. Uh, he had friends at the FCC. We went to the FCC. We talked to the ARL. They agreed to support it. And we came up with a uh, band plan of uh, 97.221, which is the automatic subbands. Since then, Nothing has really been accomplished uh, since uh, we uh, came up with 97.221. It really hasn't, uh, it really hasn't uh, worked out uh, for uh, the ARL uh, had a band plan uh, and their plan was an excellent plan. I was on the band planning committee. Vic Poor was the chairman of the band planning committee and the ARL ditched it uh, because of the um, this was just when the internet was uh, coming into fruition and people weren't used to mass uh, resistance and they got mass resistance about everything. And this was one of them. Um, and so they ditched their, their opportunity. Today, the FCC is not the same FCC it was back then. Uh, for those of you who deal with the FCC, wireless division, amateur uh, division of the wireless bureau understand uh, that the uh, flavor of the, the, the context of, of what's taking place now, they don't even have time to deal with the amateur division, really. Um, Bill Cross, what left, uh, the, who was the, the uh, mainstay in the amateur division, left about six years ago, retired, got married. They have not replaced him. Uh, so it's a tough, it's a tough thing. Uh, to get the FCC to pay any attention, much less uh, research it and, and move forward with it. So uh, again, anything that the Amateur Radio uh, Safety Foundation could do to assist the ARL more than we're doing, um, please let us know. We've been down, the, we've had this rodeo several times. <laughs> I've been bucked around a little bit as well. <coughs> Excuse me, folks. Um, didn't mean to cough in your ear, everybody. Um, there are any more questions here? Any more answers? Just a comment. Okay, go ahead. Just a comment to Steve that, yeah, we were very fortunate that uh, we got uh, David Sadal back on our side to interface with the guys at the FCC. And, and I think moving forward, you got to get past this pandemic stuff now. And uh, and for people that are, are wondering about the uh, the, the band plan, um, the band plan will be, I, I believe, will be voted upon upon our July meeting. Our July meeting this year will be a, uh, it sounds like it's going to be a, a, a Zoom conference just like this one. And the, uh, this band plan that we've been working so hard on and have been beat up so much about um, from both sides, uh, I think will be resolved and be able to be submitted to the FCC here, I think, after, uh, after this month, uh, or after July. So, so there, there is some movement on that. If you guys uh, that are in, in my division, um, I talk about it in my last newsletter. But uh, anyway, things are moving, and, and that's a, a lot of that would be a thanks to Dave's at all. Anyway, back to you there, Dan. Okay, thanks, Mike. Anybody else? Just want to thank you for the opportunity you've given us, and uh, we look forward to. I don't look forward to seeing myself talk, 
but uh, <laughs> you're doing fine. You're doing fine. You did a great presentation. Appreciate you and the people that you uh, you call upon to support your uh, in this process here. It's been great. Um, we'll have to do something similar uh, pretty soon, and uh, keep in touch. We'll see where we go with that. Is there anybody else? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to close this thing out here shortly. I wish everybody the best of 73s. I will get the, the video as soon as I get all crunched down and everything and out there, I'll get links to everybody and you can send them to other people. I hope you will. Uh, this is an important subject that needs to be uh, discussed and uh, exposed. So with that, I'll say my 73s and let's, one last call. Anything for, from anybody? Uh-oh, Craig's got his hand up. Nope, the Greg just said hi, bye. All right, 73s. Thank you.